Castlevania fans have been crying out for a new game in the series for years, so much so they paid $5.5 million on Kickstarter just to get one. But when the company that made Castlevania isn't listening, it's up to the original director of Castlevania Symphony of the Night to create a new franchise that can fill that void. And he and his team have done just that, with not just one game, but two. One in the much-loved Metroidvania style, and another in the classic NES platformer style. Hi, this is Billy from Pop Culture Full Screen, and today we're going to take a look at Bloodstained Ritual of the Night and Curse of the Moon. So let's start with Curse of the Moon. You play as Zingetsu, combating demons to break a curse that was placed on him. This game is based on the 80s Castlevania games. It has an 8 bit graphic style where you travel through 8 levels, swarming with enemies, and massive bosses. So let's get into the good and the bad. Curse of the Moon has multiple characters to choose from as you play. Uh, there is Zengetsu, as we've mentioned, who's like a samurai warrior. He can have sub-weapons where he can throw fire down, gain extra strength. Zengetsu is one of the more fun characters to play with because of his versatility. It's almost like Curse of the Moon is really his game. Then you have Miriam, who's the star of Ritual of the Night. Um, she plays more of a minor role in this game. You can also jump higher. Uh, giving you access to um, other areas that are out of reach from some of the smaller jumping characters. And she can slide. You have Albert, who's uh, an alchemist, has tremendous magic power, low health, low attacks power. Ter magic powers make up more than that. He can cover the screen with electric, um, has a fire shield, freeze enemies instantly and then smash them into pieces. And finally you have Jeebel, who's got a very much Dracula vibe going on in this. Um, he can turn into a bat and fly around and gain access to out completely out of reach areas. He has these three little bats that he casts out at an angle. So yeah, the good thing about this is that having these multiple characters and abilities um, allows the, the levels to branch off. So depending on what character you have at what stage, you can travel to different areas of uh, the level and gain access, take shortcuts, um, take different routes that have different challenges. Some enemies are very easy to beat with certain character combinations where uh, if you haven't got that character or that character has died at that time um, you will have a real challenge at your hand trying to get past them. Castlevania games are notoriously difficult um, generally because if you get hit by an enemy your character jumps back, falls into a bottomless pit and dies instantly or into another enemy and gets hit again. So, and the enemy placement always takes advantage of this knockback mechanic that all Castlevanias have had since the dawn of time. The different skill levels that um, Curse of the Moon have allows you to tweak your experience to actually enjoy it, making it more open to other players. So, you can turn off this knockback mechanic. So, you can have the game as hard as you want, but you don't get knocked back when you get hit. Um, which helps you learn the game and, and learn the levels. It's a good thing. Um, you can make the game easier, which again, Castlevania doesn't often have skill levels in their games. Another good thing about the skill levels is the fact that when you play through the game, you get to choose whether you want to recruit extra characters to your party or not. If you choose not to do that, then you're cutting away those extra mechanics and characters that you can swap to and take advantage of their abilities for. Without them, the game obviously becomes harder. A particular boss is really easy when I have this character, but now that character's not in my party. I wonder how Zengetsu will do it by himself. 
and they also change the story and the abilities of certain characters as you play if you make those choices so the skill level is really different it's like it's like a constant moving thing depending on what you do and how you play which i think is great the boss battles they're very impressive they look very colorful there's a lot of detail to them each boss is memorable with different types of attacks um, and when you play them the second time you, you think right what character can i use next how am i going to combat this battle or if you haven't got that character what other characters how are they going to fare against those bosses build the world in a way that these kind of platform games are famous for a good boss battle can make or break a game sometimes and um, curse of the moon is definitely one of those ones where it makes it there isn't too much not to like here with this game um, if you like traditional tra platformers from the 8-bit Nintendo Entertainment System era, this is definitely for you. And any anyone who's not really experienced them, this is a good entry point for you. So it was quite tough to choose things that were bad about this package. Castlevania fans uh, are used to that extra challenge, um, and you don't really get that here. The even if you choose the hardest skill level and you take all the uh, options to make you at a disadvantage, it never reaches the dizzy heights of any of the Castlevania games difficulty. Um, it has its hard parts, don't get me wrong. The Castlevania games, however, I know people who have played those games for years and still can't get past a certain level because it is that difficult. You won't get that with Curse of the Moon. So I think Castlevania fans, um, hardcore Castlevania fans, will be disappointed of how easily they will be able to get through this game. Potentially. Now I've played both Bloodstained games, I was under the impression that Curse of the Moon was going to be a prequel to Ritual of the Night, and it didn't really work out that way. They're almost like completely separate games. You could, at a stretch and with imagination, try and put them together um, with the Curse of the Moon kind of story uh, having this option where you could rewind time and do things again. Hill that then gets you rewind time somehow. I was hoping that they would use this as a catapult to try and build Bloodstained's world a bit more. They could have done that, and with a bit of thought, they could have actually made the two games connect a bit better than they do. Bloodstained. Now on to Ritual of the Night. It's a Metroidvania game which comes from uh, the Metroid franchise and the later Castlevania game franchises. The fans kind of mix the two names together to sort of explain the genre. So they are platform games, normally with a large map connecting different areas instead of a level with a definitive starting and stopping point. The map will have, what appears to be at first, many dead ends and impassable areas but as you explore you unlock new abilities for your character. These abilities will allow you to revisit these dead ends and unlock new areas. In Ritual of the Night you play as Miriam. She's a shard binder with crystals that are sewed into her skin and this gives her the ability to steal powers from defeated enemies. She is venturing into this big castle and surrounding area to stop another character called Jeebel. He is also a shard binder, but he wants to use his abilities to release demons onto the world and kill us all. One of the things that's essential about these Metroidvania style platform games is to have a cool character that you like to invest time in and upgrade, as well as a decent level design so you don't get frustrated. You're going to be spending a lot of time on this one map, and although you'll have different areas to visit, if the map is frustrating and difficult to navigate, these games will fall apart on you. Thankfully Bloodstained has a tremendously well designed map with many warp points, so you can go to these warp rooms and teleport from one huge chunk of the map to the other and get on with your quest quite well. And all the characters are well designed, um, the art style is tremendous, the level design and the way the levels look are really really good and well thought out. There's enough variety in there, there's not two areas that look very similar. And I didn't really find the bosses that interesting. After Curse of the Moon and a lot of the other Castlevanias that this will constantly be compared to, Bosses were a big thing. You'd get into a boss room and change the music quite dramatically. Um, there might be an intro to it. 
the bosses would be memorable, tough, you'd die a few times, have to level up and come back. Um, the bosses were a big deal, and in Bloodstain I didn't get that. They're almost like big, normal enemies. Um, there was a couple of cutscenes that made them a bit more interesting, but generally, they were pretty, um, pretty average. And even the bosses that they re-rendered in 3D from Curse of the Moon, which were very memorable in Curse of the Moon, they they either don't feel or come across like the same boss, or they're just easy in comparison or, or not very interesting in comparison. But instead, they they just tend to be hit sponges where you go in, they have a few strange attacks where they jump about, move about the place, um, and you just pummel them with every ability you've got until they eventually go down. So um, bosses weren't a big deal in this game for me and uh, a bit of a disappointment every time I came to one. There are some bigger bosses towards the end, um, secret bosses and, and a few exceptions to the rule, but the, for the main part, every time you come across a boss you kind of think, near. So as you journey through the game, you come across uh, other NPCs, non player characters, which help Miriam and you level up your character. Um, you can craft items, so as you kill enemies they drop um, other items such as furs and, and teeth and claws and bits and pieces like that. You can bring all those together, mix them with the um, alchemist and create new weapons and new abilities and upgrade. Yeah, Bloodstain has a real problem with certain parts of the game uh, with direction. Now, it's only going to be a problem the first time if you wish to revisit the game again. Obviously, you're going to know what you're doing, but it doesn't overcome that frustration of getting to a point where you just have no idea where you're going next. Normally, Metroidvania games are, are, have a lot more hints in them. They uh, give you an item, um, and there's several dead, dead ends on your map that you can see from the map that you haven't uncovered yet. So if you've even forgotten where you might have been able to use this new ability you've found, you can still revisit the map, have at least some kind of clues of where to go. But because of the way Bloodstain gives you those abilities, they don't appear on the map. So Miriam, when you kill an enemy, has a chance, not a guarantee, to absorb that enemy's ability. Well, they've tied in those abilities to get to and through different areas of the level. So you might blaze through a level killing loads of enemies, but not hit that chance of getting the ability you need to progress through the rest of the story. And you have to rely on luck or a guide or maybe one of the shopkeepers just dropping a hint at the right time for you to go, oh, okay, I need to go back and kill this enemy a few more times to hopefully get this ability. If that doesn't happen, you could be stuck for hours, like, with no clues of where to go, especially if the shopkeepers have given you the hint at a time that you weren't ready or haven't explored the area yet, so you don't really know what they were talking about, so when you get there, you don't know or uh, relate it to that advice. That's a, that's a real big problem. With, with progression in the game and I think a lot of people will get very frustrated. One of the most amazing parts of uh, Ritual of the Night is the music. It is absolutely phenomenal. As you're playing through these levels and this well constructed, orchestrated themed play, it is it's so so good as you listen to these and you just find yourself just stopping and taking it in or revisiting areas just to hear the music again. Um, again, it, it, it makes it fun to play and revisit areas if you have to backtrack through. You think, oh brilliant, I've got to go through and listen to um, uh, Voyage of Promise again. Finally, the, uh, the biggest disappointment for me is um, I played the Switch version. And generally when a game is ported to a less powerful machine, you tend to optimise by taking graphics away and putting other things in, maybe changing some of the framework to make it run smoothly. They didn't do that with this on the Switch version. It's unfortunate, they seem to just have gone in with the intention of it's going to be on the Switch, the Switch has sold really well, but put it on there, if it doesn't run well just take something away and keep doing that until it works well enough. 
okay, fair enough. You you, you know the the resolution is not going to be as as high in these areas, and for the most part, especially like the main characters, you you wouldn't notice unless they're side by side. But when I finished the game and went online to see what other people thought and come across this myself, it did leave a, a bit of taste in my mouth to think to to see some of the levels and what they were supposed to look like compared to what they did. Now, there's also some debate about sometimes when dialing back on the graphics actually helped the game but for the most part the switch version does look like you're looking through steamy glasses which is a real shame the switch can do good looking games and they can port really well just look at doom as an example for that now it also affected performance so there's certain areas where the game ramps up on things happening on the screen at once the clock tower and the mechanical rooms tend to be the ones that come to mind straight away. Uh, the graphics slow down. Now they never affected me enough to say, okay, this game is unplayable, but it is enough to go, now that's a bit uncomfortable. The nothing, Bloodstained isn't a high demanding game. It's a 2D platformer, something that the Switch does really well. So you're looking at it, the game as it stands and things are zoomed out on all versions anyway and you just can't help but think why is this slowing down what is it that's on this game that is making this game chug along and look so bad from time to time and you scratch your head trying to figure it out because there is not really any reason for it so it just comes down to optimizing there could have been things they could have changed and tweaked to make the game run just as well on the switch as it does on the other platforms and they know that and the reason they know that is that over 60% at time of recording this of sales of Bloodstained Ritual of the Night are on Switch. So now they know the main bulk of their fan base is on Switch. They're rushing around to try and fix um, the problems with the Switch port. Um, hopefully they can make it look more attractive but I know for a fact that they're looking to try and stop the slowdown and some of the way the game handles and moves. This is unnecessary, uh, you look at other games that have been ported and other games that Nintendo's created, there's no reason for a game as non-graphically demanding as Bloodstained not to run a, like a dream on the Switch. Doesn't affect the other games, if you play it on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One you'll be very happy with it, uh, runs effortlessly. Just really unnecessary performance issues on the Switch that could quite easily be overcome with a bit of effort. So fingers crossed that they can deliver on that. I really enjoyed my time with Bloodstained. Uh, Curse of the Moon is a fun playthrough, uh, you can experience it over and over again, try different character combinations uh, and experience the levels and see bits of the level you didn't see last time. Um, I'll always go back to that whenever I get a spare half an hour, whenever I can. Um, Ritual of the Night, the performance issues do bring it down a bit, hopefully they'll fix that soon and uh, add more features and uh, maybe even boost the graphics and make that a better experience. Um, but it's still a fantastic Metroidvania game with plenty to see, plenty to do. When you replay it again, you can try different combinations on attacks and armor and weapons, uh, again, to give you a different experience. Uh, the abilities are so many in that game that you can really have a different character almost every time you play it. Um, and that music and that map is so much fun to experience and go through um, that it does make it one of the best in the genre. So, go enjoy Bloodstained. I did, so I know you will too. This is Billy from Pop Culture Pause Screen, and I'll see you next time.